लेट स्टार्ट आप प्लीज बिस्मिल्लाह कीजिए बिस्मिल्लाह कीजिए बिस्मिल्लाह करें ओके सर बिस्मिल्लाह भाई शुरुआत कीजिए शुरुआत करें जी 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 बिल्कुल बाय हिज विद हिज ग्रेस एंड बाय हिज नेम यू स्टार्ट या या प्लीज स्टार्ट ओके सर अ वेरी वार्म एंड प्लेजेंट गुड मॉर्निंग टू आवर रिस्पेक्टेड स्पीकर्स ऑनरेबल डेलीगेट्स एंड ऑल द पार्टिसिपेंट्स हु हैव रजिस्टर्ड फॉर दिस कोर्स आई निखिलेश कुमार दिलवालिया feel privileged to extend my warm welcome to you all and on behalf of our department of physics and it shrinagar today we all gather here for the short term course that we will take us to the journey starting from semiconductor physics to smart devices leading to intelligent automation organized by department of physics and it shrinagar in collaboration with semiconductor society of india new delhi before beginning with today's adventure there are a few ins- key instructions to the participants that are needed to be followed throughout the session number 1 in case of any query or clarification about 10 minutes will be allotted for question and answer session towards the end of each session kindly use the raise hand function in the participant panel so all participants are requested to keep their audios muted at all times during the session the participants are encouraged to use the chat window to key in their queries or to communicate technical issues public and private messages written in the chat window during the session are saved automatically be mindful of what you write or share now to begin with the inauguration session i would like to introduce our convener of for the short term course dr m s shah Dr. Amisha has a doctoral degree in condensed matter physics for Jamia Mill Islam. During his during his 22 okay. years of academic career within India and abroad, he is credited please, for please, please. many initiatives for students. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Shah thank has been you. the brain behind PM's initiative of Inspire internship program for bright students of the valley. Invited many luminaries for. interaction dr shah is also credited for organizing international summit on nanotechnology for better living in collaboration with prestigious institutions like iit kanpur and iit khadakpur first time in the valley covering the contemporary developments of nanotechnology dr shah has authored two textbooks on nano science edited three books and number of articles on current issues including on new education policy and on examination reforms dr shah is also credited for la- launching masters program in physics at nit shrinagar making our department a post graduate department now now i would request dr shah to brief us about the short term course on semiconductors shah sir please thank you naklesh thank you <coughs> bismillah professor Rakesh Sahgal, Honorable Director, National Institute of Technology, Srinagar. Professor Ali Muhammad Wani, former Director, National Institute of Technology, Srinagar. Professor R K Sharma, Chairman, Semiconductor Society of India. Distinguished Professor at Solid State Physics Laboratory, New Delhi. Professor J Kumar. the today's speaker the honorable professor at anna university chennai professor m f wani tq coordinator professor gulam ashraful harman dean research and consultancy professor said kaiser bukhari registrar national institute of technology srinagar dr prince samad ganai head department of physics professor ikram professor rubab dr vijay dr harkirat dr zubair colleagues from the other institutions and from national institute of technology srinagar dear students a very good morning to all of you i am both i am privileged and i am honored to welcome you all on this auspicious inaugural ceremony of five days in five days short term course on 
semiconductors to smart devices to artificial intelligence or to intelligent automation, which begins from today up to 5th of May 2021. I'll share a few things about this program. I'm delighted to share. The moment Professor Sahagal came to know about this initiative, Dr. Prince, you also note this thing. Professor Sahagal came to know about this initiative of the department for the students. Approval was granted without any delay and was communicated to me through phone. Number two, when Dr. Singh, Secretary of Semiconductor Society of India, came to know about this initiative. He kindly gave a consent that Semiconductor Society of India would like to extend hands in organizing this summit. Thank you, Sharma Saab. Thank you, Singh Saab, and the August members of Semiconductor Society of India for extending hand to us. Number third, within few days of this launch, probably we have received more than 800 registrations from all across the country. Probably almost all states and union territories students have joined us, including few from abroad. Number four, within few days, we have been able to invite topmost scientists working on semiconductors Yeah, is there any problem? Yes, sir. Shah, sir. Yes, Internet is weak. Yeah, Shah, sir. Kahi chale gaye hain la. Aisa is yes, screen ke upar aane hi rahe. He is not visible yes, on the screen now. I think he is uh, internet uh, dropout, something like. Is he uh, addressing from home? Sir, actually there is some internet issue in the campus. Internet okay. is down. Yeah, internet is fluctuating, it seems. Yes, sir. I have also connected through mobile phone. Okay, okay. My hotspot is working. I tried to contact Kaleem in the morning, but nobody could come except Saddam because of curfew. Oh, yeah, because of curfew. Yeah, Nikhilesh, then you start something else. Okay, uh, sir. We assume that uh, Dr. Shah has uh, given his address. Okay, sir. A builder who could yeah, put yeah, together yeah. any. It's okay, sir. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay now. Please. Uh, okay. Am I audible? Am I audible, sir? Yeah. Am I audible? Yeah, you are audible. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, I was I was discussing this to my students. I was sharing a story of three people uh, who made the who made really. Uh, the great invention about the transistor, the three people were having three different temperaments. One was a critical thinker, one was a critical tinkerer, and the third one was uh, having a vast visionary. The one who was a think thinker was a John Bardeen. The one who was a tinkerer was Walter Bratteen, and the one who was a visionary was William Shackley. All three were topmost scientists. They met after World War II and their unique skills brought together in one laboratory created the perfect environment for their great invention, the transistor. We are reaping now the benefits of that great invention. Dear students, I have always, I have always argued and I, I will request now in this August forum Make small groups and work on new projects so that the 
people outside your laboratories could be benefited. Organizing such programs should give, should inspire you for that and give you a platform to work on different aspects of this one. I'm sure you will gather so much information and so much knowledge after completion of this short term program. During pandemic and after pandemic, there is no doubt that new technologies will continue to develop, benefit to society and improve the life in various ways. Medical electronics is most widely developing field of this era and by using medical electronics, please see how doctors and surgeons are being benefited and how patients feel relief. There are many friends where this field can be further explored for the crisis which the world is facing. Before I leave, I'll remain with you throughout this course. For now, I'll quote Swami Vivekananda, who used to say, go all of you whenever there is an outbreak of plague or famine, or whenever the people are in distress, go and mitigate with their sufferings Reach this idol from door to door and you will yourself be benefited by it. And at the same time, you are doing good to your country. As a convener, I'm proud and feel pr greatly honored that as a team, we have proven that once determination is there and the will to achieve is embedded in the soul, everything is possible. Thank you, my dear students, particularly Mr. Niklesh, and to his team for making it possible. And by the grace of Almighty, we'll continue to do more for the betterment of humanity and for the nation. Thank you, stay blessed. Over to you, Mr. Neklesh. Thank you, sir. Over to Thank you, you very Mr. Much for your... Thank you very much, sir, for your encouraging words. We are privileged to have you amongst us. Now to introduce, Dr. Prince Ganai, Chairman Short Term Course, HOD Physics of our department, NIT Srinagar. Dr. Prince is working in NIT Srinagar and holds a doctoral degree in nuclear and particle physics from Kashmir University. He has been awarded gold medal by the Faculty of Science with distinction from Kashmir University. During his 21 years of academic career, he has published more than 70 research papers in international journals of great repute. He held up the responsibility of department in 2019 as head of the department and is working efficiently and helping our department to blossom. Now I would request Dr. Prince to welcome everyone and address the audience. Prince, sir, please. Thank you, Tiklesh. Thank you. Good morning, all the participants. It's my honor and great pleasure to welcome our distinguished guests Professor R. K. Sharma, Chairman, Smith Nuclear Society of India, and Professor A. M. Vani, a well known figure from the field of electronics and the former director of our institute. I also extend my warm welcome to Director of our Institute, Professor Rakesh Sahigal, a leader with difference, our Registrar Sahab, Professor S. K. Bukhari, deans, guests, faculty, and all participants. Actively engaged with online activities since the breakdown of pandemic. With support from our director, we took lead in organizing online conferences, webinars, short term courses to keep our students in touch with current happenings in different fields of research and physical science. This short term course about journey from semiconductor physics to smart devices to intelligent automation is need of our smart grids, automate, autom autonomous vehicles, medical systems and ro robust. Uh, ro uh, Robotics are revolutionizing the way we live and work. Semiconductor industry, which has powered every generation of the microchip from last 50 years, is gearing up for 5G, the long promised network designed to operate at exponentially higher speeds than anything humans have ever experienced till date. Semiconductors have played a vital role in technological advancements. However, with the rapid speed of innovation dictated by the demands of fourth industrial revolution, Innovation with different semiconductor manufacturing space will pave the way for advanced innovation. 
With these rapid technological advancements comes an unprecedented opportunity as well as many challenges for the development of innovative chips with greater processing power at higher yield and free of containments. Semiconductor industry has seen particular growth in the automation applications market due to the growing demand of autonomous driving features, connectivity and safety environmental mandates. According to the recent Gartner forecast by 2022, automobiles will require nearly 50% more semiconductors as cars become more automated, cleaner, and more connected. With these increased demands, the semiconductor industry is met with further opportunities to develop and manufacture advanced sensors, communication modules, high-speed connectivity, powerful data processing capabilities, and more. I hope the course will be a great journey of our recent achievements in the field of semiconductor physics and smart devices as we have invited speakers of international repute in this field. I wish you all to have a wonderful experience and great learning time. Thank you and wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, Prince. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was very Thank informative. You. We are happy to have you amongst us. Moving forward, we have uh, Professor Mohammad Ikram, sir, Senior Professor, PG Department of Physics, NIT Srinagar, but uh, due to some circumstances, he could not join us. So we'll move forward to Professor Kesar Bukhari, sir, Registrar, uh, NIT Srinagar. Professor Saeed Kesar Bukhari, working, on, working as Registrar of NIT Srinagar, holds his doctoral degree in geology for hard rock analysis. He joined NIT Srinagar in year 2000 and extended his 21 years of services on various positions, including Dean Alumni and as Associate Dean Student Welfare. He has more than 20 years of teaching experience at Department of Civil Engineering, Teaching, Building, uh, Materials, Geology and Min Mineralogy, Engineering, Geology, Engineering, Seismology, Rock, Mechanics and Tunnel Technology to undergraduate and postgraduate students. And an alumnus of Jammu University, Professor Bukhari, is a brain behind setting up many things right at NIT Srinagar. Now I would request Dr. S.K. Bukhari to address the meeting. You need to, you know, mute uh, all others. Am I audible? Yeah, you are yeah. Professor Lucky Sagal, Director NIT Srinagar. Seri. Professor A. Mangi, Ex Director NIT Srinagar. Professor M. F. Mani, Coordinator TQP. Professor G. A. Harman, Dean Research and Consultancy. Prince Ganai, Head Physics. Good morning to everyone. It gives me immense pleasure and honor to welcome you all to this webinar, Journey from Semiconductors to Smart Devices to Intelligent Automation, organized by Department of Physics and IT Srinagar in collaboration with Semiconductor Society of India. In the present world, if we think of any sort of development, then the presence of science and technology cannot be ignored. If we look back, we'll find that every next decade, one generation is advancing in the field of mobile technology, starting from the first generation, 1G in 80s, second generation, 2G in 90s, third generation in 2000s, fourth generation in 2010s, and now fifth generation, 5G. We are advancing towards more and more sophisticated and smarter technology. The evolution of technology is like a boon to the world. As human beings come to know a lot about the world they are living in, including the activities they indulge into. Once a new technology appears, it becomes a potential building block for future technologies that utilize it for something new and usually more complex. In short, technology creates itself out of itself. Technology builds out not just from combination of what exists already, but from the constant capturing and hardness of natural phenomena. 
At the very start of technological time, we directly picked up and used phenomena, the heat of fire, the sharpness of flaked obsidian, the momentum of stone in motion. All that we have achieved comes from harnessing these and other phenomena. And combining the pieces that result, every technology stand upon a pyramid of others that made it possible in a succession that goes back to the earliest phenomena that humans capture. It tells us that all future technologies will derive from those that now exist. Furthermore, the development of technology along with the advancement in science helps to bring in a revolution in various fields such as medicine, agriculture, education, information and technology, smart devices, artificial intelligence and many more. When you look inside a piece of technology, its components are changing all the time. That is one of the main benefits of modularity. It allows the insights to morph in a dynamic way that speeds up technology's evolution. Development of advanced instruments facilitated scientists to measure the distance between sun and earth. The intensity of sun's rays, the revolution of celestial bodies, internal problems of human beings, etc. The advancement of technology generally evokes a range of emotions in people from all walks of life. Some view technology as a great evil that slowly diminishes our humanity, while others view it as a way to bring the world closer together and to help solve some of our greatest challenges. If evolution in its fullest sense holds in technology, then all technologies, including novel ones, must descend in some way from the technologies that preceded them. Technologies are recursive in nature, just like the practical technologies within technology, all the way down to the elemental parts and up to the large societal systems. The rapid advancement of the global industry has led to energy shortage and environmental pollution. To mitigate against these issues, research, researchers and scientists are developing simple and efficient techniques. Among these, Semiconductor industry has gained widespread attention as a pivotal solution to energy scarcity and environmental protection. Over the past few years, significant research efforts have been devoted to improving the efficiencies of semiconductor materials. In recent years, this technology has shown great potential as a low cost, environmental friendly and sustainable technology, and it has become a hot research topic. The present webinar aims to address the various aspects of this growing technology, including working principles of semiconductors, latest advances in the field, and the future of semiconductor de devices. This webinar will be of great importance to transfer the knowledge to benefit all. Last but not the least, I would like to congratulate the coordinator, convener of this program, Dr. Amish Shah, for organizing this workshop. And I'm sure the participants of this short-term course will get benefited by leaps and bounds. Thank you, thank you one and all. Thank you very much, sir, for such a kind words. Now, moving further, we have Professor M.F. Vani, Chairman, Center Research Facility Center, NIT Srinagar, but due to some circumstances, he could not join us. So we'll move forward again. We have uh, Professor G.A. Harmain, Dean Research and Consultancy, but he's also uh, busy with some meeting. So he could not join us for the session. Now, moving further, I would like to uh, introduce Professor uh, A.M. Vani, former director in IT Srinagar. Professor A.M. Vani, the first director of NIT Srinagar, has a doctorate in electrical engineering, biomedical engineering from IIT Delhi. The distinguished professor has his immense contribution in the development of NIT Srinagar DAT2 during tough times. Presently working as distinguished professor, Professor Vani is also credited for establishing a couple of departments in Central University Kashmir. As a founder, head of electronics and communication engineering department at REC Srinagar. He has been responsible for setting up major laboratories in department 
and as coordinator of computer center established lan and internet facilities at nit srinagar during during his early career at rec srinagar introduced the concept of integrated circuits and devices now i would request professor am vani sir to uh, say a few words <clears throat> hello <coughs> hello oh uh, am i audible sir yes sir yes you are audible am i audible? okay good morning to all of you uh, i can see professor bukhari the world registrar the professor m ikram professor uh, m shah and uh, many others whom i am not able to see but uh, my greetings to all who are present physically as well as on the on the video and audio uh i am privileged to be among you my alma mater and uh, it it really takes me back to early 60s when i joined rdc as a student and that time the best branch was electrical engineering and there was no electronics there was no computer electrical engineering mechanical engineering and civil engineering and i remember in fact i know and uh, i am trained in electronics area uh, by means of electronic tubes i don't know how many of uh now come back across the world electronic tubes yeah it was live sir uh, after 90 after 90 <laughs> when we joined colleges yes, yes, uh, there were tubes electronic yes, tubes yes 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 i uh, mm. uh, i would like to say that my course in electronics was in electronic tubes you know mm. uh devices which were small miniature electric bulbs and they were working the same way nowadays the transistor the semiconductor is now working uh and i am always fascinated by history am i audible sir Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. You are audible. Uh, I am, uh, in fact, like history of science and technology, and uh, electronic tubes were, as some of you who have a passion for electronics must know, that it was invented in 1988 by Thomas Edison. and later in 1904 ambrose fleming invented diode and with these electronic components we the people at that time were able to make electronic circuits for communication for television and even for computers the first electronic computer the first of its kind electronic computer which is called eniac electronic numerical integrator and computer this was the first yes, electronic yes, computer this was in 1946 and uh, at most school 
and it was so big and so large that it occupied thousand cubic feet in space. But nevertheless, it was developed during World War II and was intended to be used for calculation. And uh, it was taught gold days. Uh, there were computer scientists, Turing, and uh, and uh, Shannon, and uh, many others who proclaimed that if we are able to make an electronic brain using electronic components, the components were tubes and the computer, if possible, would be so big, as big as Empire States of America. Remember, <laughs> please? Uh, Empire States of America was, th those days, the tallest building in the world, 110 uh, stories, and now it's housing probably the United States, uh, the uh, United Nations office in New York. And that would be the size of the computer. It could use the old generation electronic tubes. And uh, it will be so energy consuming, it generates much heat that you need to cool it and nothing less than Niagara Falls, Niagara Falls, the famous falls, is one of the seven wonders of America world, Niagara Falls, waterfalls. You need so much water to cool it if you want to keep it functional. So that was, uh, you know, the estimates that if you use electronic tubes for making computers, which would simulate the function of human brain, the size would be fantastic. Now, obviously, you know, we made computers, we made television, we made everything that was possible during those days. Uh, yet, the electronic tubes were very large to handle and transport and fabricate. And therefore, as smart physicists, they invented transistors. Transistor, as you know, is a semiconductor device. The most important semiconductor device is transistor detected in the transfer register. And this was invented and developed by, as Professor Shah has said, Shockley, Bardi, and Bertrand. They were given a Nobel Prize in 1958. So it was <clears throat> during that time, 1958, the would be as small as one millimeter or two millimeters length and breadth. And what you see these days in the form of transistor is actually the packing which connects the input, output, and battery. So, transistor was able to be fabricated on a surface that was killed in 1958. He, he, he gave to the world the first multiple circuits on a single chip. Nowadays, we call them chip 
or integrated circuits are IC. And 1971, the first microcomputer, which we call microprocessor, was developed by Intel Corporation. Microprocessor is the basis for personal computers, which further got compressed. And nowadays, you have a personal computer in your pocket. Now, compared to the building, you know, the states of America, now in your pocket, in the form of smartphone. Smartphone is, is called smart because it has a, a computer chip of a different type, of course. But you can use a lot of functions of computer chip in your telephone, in your mobile phone. So that is, now there is no turning back. We are in the in the, uh, the scientific age. And let me admit, it has been the physicists who have invented things for us, discovered them, and later as engineers, we took those scientific principles and made use of them in the form of technology. So we call it, uh, Technology. Technology is nothing but application of science. And so far as I'm concerned, uh, having a fascination for physics is the physics, which is the real brain behind all the most of the science and technology inventions in the world. Physics has entered not only in physical world, but in biological world. Biophysics is a very fascinating field of physics, which tries to describe the action and functions of human body in the form of, in, the, in terms of physical principles, a completely new area, and a large number of Nobel Prizes have been in the field of biophysics, either in the discipline of physics or in the discipline of medicine. And if you discover something which is more related to uh, physiology and medicine, you get a Nobel Prize in physiology and medicine, even though you are a physicist. And there are many, many examples. And similarly, if it is related to technology, then you get the physics, physics Nobel Prize. Uh, oh, we, uh, I was mentioning that when I, I entered RDC, our syllabus in electronics was predominantly electronic tools. <clears throat> and I'm sure the Department of Electrical Engineering is still possessing those boards on which we were doing the experiments. It would be wonderful if REC or NIT, now we call it, it, it arranges to have a museum starting from electronic tubes to transistors, microprocessors, now computers, and other devices. And I, uh, believe me, it has all the infrastructure to give to the new generation the whole picture of how electronics has developed. So in my student time at REC, I learned electronic tubes. Later, when I went for research PhD, I had to use transistors. So I had to learn it more or less myself because that was the requirement. And when I became a system professor, and I had to teach integrated circuits. And later, 
started the computer programs and land network and communication facilities and uh, so on and so forth. So this has been my journey, starting from old generation electronic to going in computers, semiconductors, and chips, circuits. Oh, Computers now. And uh, uh, I have a all these. And now I think information technology at Central University of Kashmir. And uh, it's again based on electronics. And that will be semiconductor. So I, I, I am very happy that uh, uh, Dr. M. Shah and his colleagues and the uh, administration of the state support this program. The present state of affairs and a change, exchange ideas and talk about. In fact, I have very good opportunity. And uh, uh, I only say, uh, Department of Electrical Engineering, physicist, Professor Lee, even our uh, first founder, that, that uh, founder principal of RIC, that is the that you have the physics. So the people from physics area have said, damn it, I can make you all kinds of physics to venture into the studies and research in this fascinating area. Remember, it's a fundamental science. And it's now taking new forms. Now, nanotechnology, particle physics, and you know, before, I come. It has always been my pleasure. Whenever I get a call from an ITRC, I still call it RIC because to me that's more important because that's the foundation. You call it by anything, you find it in your work that that uh, uh, that speaks. And during the time when it was a time to name, rename. REC, they asked us what are the names that we use. In fact, one of the names was Central Institute Engineering. In fact, somebody had, uh, uh, but uh, there was a, in those days, to call it national, so we called it national. So it was a consensus uh, arrived at. And, so that's why I have more uh, fascination for engineering, call it engineering rather than technology. Because technology is so with that uh, I I I do hope we'll be meeting in many sessions and I give best of my luck to organizers and thank you to organizers and uh and uh which uh, uh,
and uh, uh, Professor Bukhari has always been a support to all such programs. Even when I was there, he would always be there to help me to go. I, I, I give you my greetings and we'll be meeting session. Thank you all. Thank you, respected sir, for your kind words. We feel privileged to work in this institution. Now moving on to introducing our chairman, Professor R.K. Sharma of today's short term course. Hello. 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 Yes, Vani, sir. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Hello. Okay, sir. Professor Vani, sir. Professor Vani. Professor Vani, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, feel proud that your REC is now flourishing by all means. Thank you very much. I'm very happy. <laughs> feel privileged, feel blessed that REC Sirinagar under the dynamic leadership of Professor Sahagal is flourishing by all means. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I understand that because uh, uh, very recently, uh, for the last uh, few years, in fact, since uh, Professor Sahagal was there, just really coming to the limelight and uh, nothing pleases me like uh, seeing once again. During those days, we were at number three or number four because we were fourth REC in the country. And there was a a team had come when I was a student. There was a proposal to convert, rename REC into But later, the proposal was postponed. And I will indeed be looking forward to a future time when NIT graduates. IIT, Indian Institute of Technology. That will be my wish. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I came in 1955-66 at Trump to Nishimbad, where we were housed to inspect, have talked with faculty, but uh, then, of course, circumstances changed. And uh, we as students were informed they have come that we might be named as Indian Institute of Technology as early as 1965-66. And I hope the time will repeat now. And the team will be coming. So, well, that's my wish. Uh, I may not be speaking on Earth, but that is the which I have nurtured and uh, I wish it has all the talents, it has all the, you know, men and material, but it's, it's just a matter of initiatives. If you take initiative, nothing is impossible. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 
Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Niklesh, please invite Sharma Saad. Please. Now moving uh, on to introducing our chairman, Professor R.K. Sharma of today's short term course. Professor R.K. Sharma is currently a visiting professor at Department of Material Science and Engineering, IIT Delhi. He joined DRDO's Solid State Laboratory in 1982 as Scientist B and retired from the position of Distinguished Scientist and the Director in December 2018. He has led several R&D programs on development of strategic semiconductor materials and devised for a variety of defense applications. He has more than 100 publications in international journals. He has received several recognitions, including Technical Group Award, Material Research Society of India Medal, DRDO's Agni Award for Excellence in Self-Reliance and DRDO Pathbreaking Research Award. Today, as a collaborative uh, for this short term course on semiconductors, I would request Professor R.K. Sharma to bless us with his kind words. Sir, kindly unmute yourself. No, I am. Oh, yeah, I'm unmuted. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, a very good morning, uh, Professor Sergal, Professor Vani, uh, Professor Bukhari. My dear friend, Professor Kumar, I'm seeing him after a long time. Uh, Professor Ganai, Dr. Shah, Dr. Niklesh, and other distinguished colleagues, as well as uh, my dear students who have joined this very, very interesting course. It's a pleasure for the Semiconductor Society India to be associated with this program, uh, which was uh, very meticulously placed by the team uh, led by uh, Dr. Shah, uh, Professor Ganai and uh, Niklesh, and they have been organizing. Uh, say, I'm seeing the way they are putting together uh, the program and then uh, organizing smoothlessly, seamlessly this uh, course. Uh, the Semiconductor Society, in fact, uh, has been in existence for about 35, 36 years, and uh, it is uh, providing wherever there is a possibility of bringing together. Uh, the scientists from national as well as international uh, platforms uh, together, it likes to associate with it. And we were very glad and happy to be associated with this program. I would like to first congratulate uh, all those uh, led by Dr. Shah who have put together this program. Uh, my compliments to Professor Wani, who has very uh, nicely articulated the, uh, the, the, the developments uh, in electronics through in semiconductors and uh, coming up to the the, the 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 you know the microprocessors being everywhere in uh, each device uh, eventually uh, what he mentioned was it uh, was also important that the physics uh, and uh, the semiconductor uh, developed electronics developed uh, through semiconductors as well as the artificial intelligence is now making you know the healthcare a revolution in the healthcare and you can see that even in the current pandemic the hrct scan is proving the the the, the lifeline for those who uh, uh, for for early detect uh, detection of the pulmonary covid and then uh, saving lives uh, i would not like to say take much time uh, but uh, would like to mention a few things uh, which semiconductor society would like uh, the students to pursue and uh, the it, it is mentioned by almost everyone uh, before me who spoke here uh, uh, but uh, that the importance of the semiconductor devices particularly the micro sensors and the systems on chip or lab on chip uh, which are required for a variety of uh, requirements in the country and uh, they are being imported mostly they are being imported we have not been able to take them to production Irrespective of the fact that we have been working uh, quite hard, we published a huge number of papers and some of the very pioneering devices were uh, developed. But then the technologists, like you know the uh, that uh, which are at IITs and NITs, they in fact 
should now, uh, uh, you know, uh, say, uh, roll their sleeves and then, you know, they should take the responsibility to get them produced in the country. Many of the devices which are required by the country do not require very high uh, semiconductor processing, um, you know, a, a small scale uh, semiconductor processing or the device processing or the polymer processing uh, is required. I think, uh, you know, the, there should be large number of um, uh, startups in the country from the graduates from IITs and NITs, which should uh, uh, bridge this gap. Yeah, we're, uh, we're, we're, definitely, we have to do this. And uh, for apart from that, uh, for, on the energy front, I think there is a huge requirement of uh, people working in wide band gap semiconductors. And the wide band gap semiconductor materials have to be developed. You see, we have been uh, we have been lagging. Professor Kumar will agree with me that uh, we have been lagging in uh, say developing our own materials for our own devices. Most of the wafers are imported. Till then, uh, till now, even if some devices are being made in the country, a uh, lot more work should be done on uh, development of semiconductor materials. And the very nicely, Professor Kumar is going to uh, address, I hope, in, in the first itself uh, talk itself, the importance of materials. Uh, eventually, uh, in fact, I uh, that's why I took because it's a educational. Uh, uh, or a, or a, or a uh, educational program, I thought I will uh, cover some basics of uh, fundamentals of uh, crystal growth and epitaxy related to semiconductors, which I think uh, on fifth I'm going to cover. And that was the reason I thought, uh, you know, let us talk about that, let the students understand that. In fact, you know, uh, 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 from devices to, 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 to integrated devices uh, to uh, you know, uh, to, to the artificial intelligence in between there is material development and, you know, until now we, are, we have our own materials, we will always be dependent. Uh, I don't know whether, uh, you know, someone came from, uh, 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 from NIT, uh, Srinagar to me and to, uh, to SSPL. I'm not sure it was, uh, Professor Shah, uh, maybe uh, uh, any of his other colleagues, but, uh, they asked me to give me some. Mercury cadmium telluride and cadmium zinc telluride crystals, and, you know, and I was happy to give them these crystals, and they took it. So uh, I think there is always had been uh, some, you know, uh, uh, some uh, inclination for working on semiconductors and IT, and very glad that they are uh, doing it uh, uh, to a larger, uh, to a greater extent now. It will be, will be very glad to be associated and uh, personally. You can uh, say I will be very happy to uh, address your students. Take any, uh, give my uh, consultation to whatever uh, you know uh, way I could. And uh, as a semiconductor society, we would like to definitely uh, uh, be a part to uh, your uh, this theme. So with all this, I again congratulate you, and I uh, uh, my my uh, best wishes for uh, for NIT Shinagar to. Be to do this program very, very successfully and do many more uh, such uh, uh, programs in future. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Professor Sharma, thank you, sir. I would like to request, sir, Sharma Saab. I had a one request. Professor Sharma, am I audible? Professor Sharma, I have one request. Am I audible, sir? To you, sir. I think he is saying, "Wait a minute." Okay, okay. Wait. Okay. Internet has gone. Okay, we'll move ahead. We'll move ahead. Naklesh, move ahead. Naklesh, move ahead. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Mm -hmm. I'll talk to him later on. Sir, I think he's calling. Yes, sir. Okay. Oh, okay, sir. Okay, sir. I'll, I, I'll ask the. Shabir, sir, please unmute Rajesh, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay.
Yes, Rajesh. So no. I could not be say I got muted and I could not unmute myself. I was not given the permission oh, okay. for that. So I'm sorry, okay, I could okay, not sir. control. No, no, it's all right, sir. It's all right. It's all right. We are thankful. I'm I'm indebted. I'm indebted for your association and really agreeing to extend your hand. I'm indebted. In fact, on behalf of whole of the administration of NIT Sri Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, when we entered, sir. Uh, second, when we entered in Delhi, it was yeah. around 95. So yeah. there was a there were a galaxy of people working on semiconductors. Right, right. And, and semiconductor society were on limelight. Mm -hmm. Definitely, it should no. come back. I think you should have a chapter uh, at uh, NIT Srinagar. And I will ask. Uh, this is what I am requesting, sir. Yeah, we so should you have can a have chapter, chapter at, at NIT Srinagar. Yeah, you will will have it. Yeah, have it. Have so please do that. Thank and, you, sir. Uh, talk to Dr. Rajan Singh. He will organize everything for you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Naklesh, please go ahead. Naklesh. Okay, sir. Moving further, I would like to introduce our honorable director, Professor Rakesh Segal. Professor Rakesh Segal an engineer by education, academician by profession, and a researcher by passion, holds BE in Mechanical Engineering from Annamalai University, Tamil Nadu, and PhD in Tribology from REC, Kurukshetra. Professor Segal developed film thickness equations for elliptical and offset half hydrodynamic journal bearing and has many publications to his credit. Professor Segal is credited for making bold initiatives at NIT Srinagar, including the appointment of around 80 faculties in various departments after the gap of 20 years, and for making MOUs with international universities and with different IITs, which has smoothened our path for receiving higher education in those institutions. Now I would request Professor Segal to bless us with his kind words. Uh, Professor R. K. Sharma, Chairman, Semiconductor Society of India, Honorable Professor A. M. Vani, former Director, NIT Srinagar, and uh, an alumnus of uh, NIT Srinagar, Professor Syed Kesar Bukhari, Registrar of NIT Srinagar. Professor Prince A. Ganai, Head of the Physics Department. Professor Simin Rubab, Professor in Physics Department. Dr. M. A. Shah, the main organizer for this program. His team members, experts for this program from different institutions. And dear participants, a very good afternoon to all of you. At the very outset, I would like to congratulate Dr. M. A. Shah, his team, and the entire physics department for taking this good initiative to educate the youth about the importance of semiconductor devices, their applications in smart devices enabled with artificial intelligence. I was just listening to various speakers who spoke before me. Really, it has been a long journey from the tube type diodes to, you know, AI enabled smart devices. It has been a long journey in late 70s, you know, when the black and white TV came earlier to that, we had, you know, big size radios in home with tube type diodes. And it has been a long journey, you know, through, uh, you know, transistors, then ICs, then, uh, you know, microprocessors. And now, you know, we have other smart devices which are enabled by uh, artificial, artificial intelligence. Really, it has been a long journey. And, uh, you know, especially those who are in this era, you know, they have seen a lot of changes in the technology. And uh, we are really, you know, grateful to the great scientists who have really contributed not only for the development of the, these devices, but of course, you know, material in between, as uh, Professor Rajesh spoke, 
and Professor A. M. Vani also spoke. It's very important and we need to understand the importance of development of the suitable or the relevant materials for these devices. And to complement these efforts, you know, we have done a lot of work in NIT Srinagar. We have a very good, uh, you know, development lab for the materials. We have Central Research Facility Center where we can not only develop the materials, we, we can also test them for, you know, various conditions. So that kind of work is going on. We have many devel developing as well as testing devices for different types of materials. And, you know, we have people working across the departments. We have people working in the uh, chemistry department. We have people working in the physics department, in electronics department, in mechanical engineering department, in metallurgy department. And uh, I hope that, you know, as a team, we must join as a team and we should allot such projects to our undergraduate and postgraduate students, you know, where they can work across the departments and they can develop really, you know, some useful devices which ultimately will benefit the society. You know, we as engineers or we as, you know, technical people, we have a big responsibility on us. We have to make the life of the people around us easy. It should be, you know, not only cost effective, the devices should be available at a very cost effective price. They should be very easy to operate. The ultimate aim of the technology is to simplify the things. You know, we have come from the age of very huge devices, as Professor A.M. Vani said. You know, we are also from that era, deck 10 computer, room size computers, where we used to use punch cards. And now, you know, we have very, every, every pocket has a small computer in the form of a mobile. So it's really, we are moving towards the miniaturization. And I don't know, you know, ultimately where it will stop. The ultimate goal is to have very simplified and very efficient and very cost effective devices, which could benefit the common man in general. And this is all our responsibility being technical institutions. And in this direction, all NITs, all IITs, all other technical institutions are really doing a lot of work. During the course of this pandemic, you know, whenever we go through the social media, we go through Facebook, we see IIT Delhi or IIT Bombay or many NITs, they are every day they are coming with new devices. They are coming with, you know, earlier we were only thought to be, you know, developing only the devices for normal industrial use. But nowadays I find that IIT Delhi and some of the other IITs or some of the NITs, they are producing such gadgets which are really used by the doctors. The, the medical practitioners. So this this is very important. You know, we have now as a technology, as a as a technical person, we have joined hand with medical professionals, and we are really working on the uh, you know very efficient biomaterials and uh, you know such devices where ultimately the life of a common man can be eased out to a large extent. So that is our ultimate aim and. I can see, you know, if I scroll through the uh, content of this program, which is being scheduled for over these five days, it's really very good, you know, right from the basics of the semiconductors to very high-end devices, everything will be covered. And there is a galaxy of the speakers from different organizations. And uh, I'm sure that the participants, I could see that uh, in the beginning, around 300 participants, uh, they had joined. So it is really beneficial for all the participants and definitely we will learn from each other's experience and uh, really it's a, it's a very good initiative by physics department. I'm also grateful to all the experts who have who have readily agreed to the request of Professor M. Shah. I'm sure Professor M. Shah has got this quality. He can he can make anybody to work for him. He has got that quality. I'm sure, and he has been exhibiting for, for you know, last three and a half years, I've seen. Once he determines that he has to do something, he will do it. And he has been instrumental in doing two, two international symposia or two international workshops on nanotechnology for a better living. So uh, that has been really, he has been instrumental in organizing many uh, DST sponsored INSPIRE projects. And uh, he is, uh, you know, they have trained almost more than 2,000 
students of plus one and plus two from the valley who have really you know uh, erodes their interest in science in, in 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 basic sciences so in a way you know the team is contributing to the community to, to the students to to the student community to other people around so it's a it's a very good initiative and i hope that he will keep on working with the same enthusiasm and uh, you know this program i wish this program a big success and uh, with these words i thank once you. again thank and congratulate the team from the physics department led by dr m a shah and uh, i am also grateful to the experts uh, especially professor r k sharma chairman semiconductor society of india who has you know uh, like collaborated with us in organizing this program our former director professor a m wani and all other speakers and all other and all the participants who have you know joined this uh, uh, course on semiconductors thank you thank you very much thank you sir thank you sir bless it bless thank you sir thank you sir thank you very much for the uh, kind mm -hmm. words now uh, finally i would like to request professor simin rubab to say the vote of thanks to all the inaugurators of the session Professor Simim Rubab has done her masters in physics from Patna University and doctorate in renewable energy from IIT Delhi. Presently she teaches physics at NIT Srinagar. She has designed and introduced courses on sustainable sustainability of for engineer, engineers. These include sustainable architecture for civil engineering and ecology and technology development for electronics and communication engineering. she supervises research studies in energy conservation and renewable energy utilization biometrics and materials for solar energy utilization she has about 40 publications in international and national journals and proceedings of uh, international and national conferences she has delivered about 26 expert talks at state institution of education ugc hrdc university of Cons Kashmir and Inspire Campus. Respected ma'am, I would request you to say a few words. And vote of thanks. And vote of thanks too. And vote of thanks too. Definitely. Uh, thank you, Niklesh, for this uh, uh, wonderful introduction. There was no need uh, for it at this time. I think mm -hmm. it's my pleasure and privilege. to offer the vote of thanks in the inaugural session of this wonderful short term course on devices uh, semiconductor physics to smart devices to intelligent automation it, it's it's really a wonderful journey and we will go through this journey uh, in this 5 uh, days uh, short term course and uh, first of all i would like my administration Uh, uh, uh which has been very supportive in uh, to physics department and to all other departments of nit in general but in particular to physics department whatever programs and initiative we thought we just conveyed it to our worthy director and he and our worthy registrar they take no time in giving us uh permission so uh, and this is not just because as a person i have in this challenging time um i have uh, some interaction with other uh, or experience as a parent of some other institutions national level but i don't find their administration working day and night like ours so thank you sir uh, both of you our uh, director sir and our registrar sir and then uh, i would like to thank our partners of this event the semiconductor uh, society physics society semiconductor uh, solid state physics lab and uh, uh, delhi and professor especially professor r k sharma who has been its chairman and now he is uh, uh, working as a visit visiting a professor at iit delhi in material science and 
metallurgy department so uh, thank you sir and uh, since you are a speaker also in this event on fourth day we have seen a glimpse of your uh, erudition uh, today itself and i would like to thank the other speaker on fourth day and our very dear professor ali mohammad wani i'm so glad to hear you sir after uh, i don't know for uh, how uh, many years ago <laughs> i son so uh, i am really really pleased and you are a role model for a paper and you should sit we should work so i am inspired by you sir and i thank you for your august present today that you have joined us then i would like to thank all the speakers today's speakers as well as uh, the speakers will the uh, worthy speakers uh, who who are going to join us during these five days especially the first technical session which will start shortly after this uh, valedictory session uh, professor jay kumar from ugc bsr uh, from a uh, faculty from anna university and then professor mohammad henini who has who is a director nottingham nanotechnology and nano science center and especially a prof, i would like to thank professor henini because whenever we have contacted him for any program he has always spared time for his valuable time for us and then uh, i would like to thank Uh, the, our team from our department, my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Ashraf Shah Sab, uh, we have uh, uh, done so many programs together, uh, so many inspired uh, programs together, and other programs, and uh, um, uh, our HOD, Prof. Professor Prince Ganai, he. actively participates in all the uh, uh, events and he guides and us and directs us and our other uh, colleagues professor ekram and uh, our uh, young and dynamic colleagues uh, zubair professor zubair uh, professor harkirat and professor vijay they are always we are a very uh, dynamic team and we are blessed to have very good students also uh, our research scholars and our uh, msc students they uh, whatever we think they execute us so they work behind the scene for us and especially mr niklesh kumar who is a uh, outgoing student of uh, the final year msc this year and he has been really really a dynamic student and whatever we wish to organize be a science quiz on a national science day or the conferences or short term course anything we just call nikhil we instruct him and he is always there at our uh, so uh, uh, really our uh, future students and uh, our first year msc student like him and then i would like to thank all the participants because in this challenging time when everybody wants to be at home and they are reluctant to join so so many people from so many professors and teachers and researchers and students from uh, all over india they say from kashmir to kanyakumari i see many people from tamil nadu not exactly from kanyakumari but coimbatore i am seeing few participants so i am really really happy that from east to west and from north to south this pandemic has given us a chance to uh, join and collaborate also because in any physical kind of um, uh, short term course so many people have not uh, joined so there is challenging uh, there are some opportunities also in uh, uh, these challenging times also so i would not uh, take much of her time and i thank each and every body and uh, if i have forgotten some name so or uh, so this is my uh, like uh, kindly apologize me for uh, i 
uh, ask you for forgiveness. This is my shortcoming if I have forgotten your know, name. So I thank each and everybody. And uh, I uh, after this uh, inaugural se session, we will be uh, joining again for the technical session. And as we say in Urdu, कि आप लोग महफूज रहें अपना ख्याल रखें बिला जरूरत बाहर ना निकले आज के वक्त में और अगर इंतहाई मजबूरी का आलम हो तो फेस मास्क और वो भी एन नाइन्टी फेस मास्क या डबल फेस मास्क लगा के निकले और कोशिश करें कि घर पे ही बने रहें और हमने आपके लिए ये जो है इंटरेस्टिंग वर्कशॉप का इनका इसी के लिए किया है और मैं तमाम मंदूबेन और तमाम शुरुआ का तह दिल से शुक्रिया अदा करती हूँ थैंक यू ऑल वंस अगेन थैंक यू मैम थैंक यू वेरी मच मैम नौ now starting for our first session of the day 1 i would like to introduce our first speaker professor j kumar professor j kumar is a ugc bsr fa faculty fellow from anna university chennai he carried out phd research work at yag and uh, nd borit crystals at anna university chennai and carried out research work at imem formerly known as maspec pharma in inp single crystal growth he has worked at university of lesi italy on the mocvd on indium gallium arsenide quantum dots on uh, gallium arsenide substrates he was involved on the epitaxial activity of photonic band gap crystals layers of quantum computation solar cell Uh, structures of high efficiency dbr structures with emphasis on gallium arsenide based substrate he has presented 157 national and 71 international papers in conference conferences professor kumar was eager to initiate the mou between the twin states j and k and tamil nadu for the benefit of both the students and faculties Now I would request Professor J Kumar to kindly start with his session, session one. Good morning to all, and I thank profusely my great friend and uh, personally a lovable person, Professor Shah, and other friend uh, Dr. Sharma, R K Sharma, who is the chairman of the semiconductor chapter. society in india and also the the present director of uh, nit who happens to be my colleague uh, in the sense uh, i also studied at anamalai university so i am very glad to know that uh, person from jnk had come all the way to the great cities of uh, tamil nadu there is a kind of uh, Uh, i visited uh, kashmir about a uh, couple of years ago and i found very unique things uh, in similarity between people are here and there the in fact it was a difficult time i don't want to mention exactly the issue and the time but still i had a few days of stay and it was one of the best uh, stays in my life or in my personal uh, interaction with uh, the great population in kashmir they were extraordinarily affectionate and they were really very kind in spite of all the difficulties they have been facing for several years i hope the present situation is better and the students are also very happy to move across and then do good things i have really found it very difficult for me to have a small stay of couple of days in the sense there was a lot of uh, surprising things for me like there are no theaters uh, people are not allowed to have internet connectivity at that uh, time at least now you have a good connectivity i guess and also there were other things which surprised me but all said and done the simplicity and the affections of the people remain the same in spite of their difficulties so i thank professor shah for this wonderful opportunity and i hope i can share my two graphs so that i can start the technical session if i am permitted i will go ahead and uh, share this uh, graph okay. 
So, uh, I have a lot of uh, personal things to say. Still, this is a session. Professor Kumar. Yes. Yeah, Professor Kumar. That's why the government recognized that there were many similarities between Jammu and Kashmir and Tamil Nadu that they have made an MOU. We still get, we yes. could not materialize. No, 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 it is still uh, in the uh, use and a couple of uh, institutions in Tamil Nadu used it. Particularly, there is an university in Karakudi. They use mm. it uh, very normally. So, we can always use it. You see, this is always a so society which evolves. So, it doesn't matter if there is an MOU or there is a, a, a kind of format. But I think people who are very kind to each other. I have met a couple of students uh, when I was the registrar of the university from Kashmir. Mm -hmm. and they were very, very polite. In fact, I asked them, where are you staying? And they didn't even want to say that they are staying in a very difficult situation. But I made them stay in a good hostel afterwards. Mm -hmm. So, Thank it you. is not about the, the kind of MOUs and the procedural things we need. It is good we have that. But we can always move ahead. And uh, so, mm -hmm. anyway. I uh, thank you for sure. reminding this and that MOU or the other uh, links which are needed can always happen. There is nothing which can prevent us from interacting. Can I go ahead? Sir, sure. thank you. Sir, sure, yes, please thank share. You. Uh, you can share now. Sit yeah, I, also, I will put the screen and uh, I'll I share, sir. Please share. I should make a share. Please share. Sir. Okay. One minute. Yeah, yeah. One. Yeah, okay. Is it seen? Is it yes, sir. Uh, no, 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 yes, sir. One minute, sir. One minute. Sir, one minute. One minute. Not still, not yet. It, it takes a time, sir. It takes a little time. Yes. Is visible? Yes, Professor Kumar. Yes, yes. Okay, so I thank uh, all those who are involved in this kind of uh, uh, short-term course in spite of all the pandemic situations. This is a positive energy I see in Kashmir, okay? In spite of all the difficulties, people are keep moving and then trying to make an impact uh, for the society as a whole. So I thank uh, everybody involved. I cannot name uh, one specific person, but certainly the administration and Professor Shah and his colleagues and the students who are happy to sit at this time to listen to a talk on semiconductor materials and devices. As my friend Dr. Sharma said, we need some kind of a structure to frame the culture of manufacturing or producing some devices. We don't need a huge facilities like Intel, IBM, they will come on their own. Uh, because they when they uh, see a possibility of uh, large scale manufacturing if uh, for example more, more smartphones are being sold in india they'll automatically establish a facility apple established a facility very recently in uh, bangalore similarly I, I want to share with uh, the students there is a company by name pc this pc is an austrian company but they have established a facility in mysore and within four years they have started uh, a budget of 500 crores. Of course, in the last one and a half years, they may be uh, not doing that much. But why I'm telling this is the PC company is a company which is involved in uh, tungsten related products. And as we all know, tungsten became extinct almost because of the uh, stop of uh, tungsten based bulbs. So the electrical bulbs, which we are using until uh, four or five years ago, they're all based on tungsten heating element. Now the tungsten element is totally not being used, but still, please see for your information, is uh, is establishing a facility in Mysore so that they can manufacture tungsten related products. There are other uh, demands on tungsten related products. For example, iron gauges are used with the tungsten filament and they are in high demand for Japanese uh, advanced device manufacturers. So, uh, we are procuring uh, the tungsten of high quality and then we have the capability in Mysore to make them 
pulled as a very fine uh, material of uh, dimensions like uh, 13 micron, 13 micron, and then it is being used for a given application. Like that, there are various applications, various demands on our country. And uh, so, youngsters may try to follow a procedure so that you can build a device unit. It may be on uh, semiconductors, it may be related to semiconductors because there are a lot of demands, not only just on semiconductors, as Dr. Sharma said, we are now moving from simple uh, semiconductor devices to artificial intelligence on the automation, which is this need of the hour. The term artificial intelligence doesn't refer to replacing the brain, but it replaces the functionality of a brain. The, it replaces the swiftness or the quickness of the brain, and that is where we are looking at these uh, areas of artificial intelligence associated with the various materials. These are also termed as smart materials or functional materials, so I will try to touch upon if I have a time. But I see this is a very short time frame. So I just want to enthuse the young minds here. Please don't limit your uh, discussions or ideas only to extending some simple devices to a different functionally operative device. Extend your minds, be active. Am I audible? Am I okay? Am I okay? Okay. So, there are uh, mechanisms to get recognitions, and one of the important mechanisms is uh, the Nobel Prize. Of course, there are other prizes also being offered nowadays for various reasons, but still Nobel Prize stands outstanding, and uh, it has to be one of the important things which we can have in mind. As all of you know, Professor Raman was the first to get the Nobel Prize, and he actually was very uh, systematic in uh, trying to take his mind. He even booked a ticket to get the Nobel Prize once he made the discovery in uh, as early as uh, in February month. He, the Nobel Prizes are awarded in uh, sometime in December 9. But he booked uh, he immediately after he realized that his discovery is very important and it is going to make a good impact, he immediately booked the ticket to reach uh, Sweden. So that should be the kind of motivation. We may have a number of uh, societal issues. Many people will uh, cow down or tell you that there is a corruption, there is a pandemic, there is uh, other problems of food and internal fighting, etc. They will be always there and the humankind always has fasted from whatever stories we have as epics like Mahabharata, Ramayana. So please don't worry about all these stories. Just you focus on your interests and try to build some good ideas so that you can get the Nobel Prize. And uh, there are a lot of uh, good things about uh, Raman, so you can try to take up those uh, good things. Okay, so uh, there is some pop up window. I do not know what is this issue about annotation by somebody. So this is uh, perhaps the mechanism. So my screen should move. Can I uh, can I make my screen move? I hope I can. Yes. Okay. So one of the important things uh, when I was uh, interested in physics was the surprising thing that I was told that uh, De Broglie was one of the youngest persons to get the Nobel Prize. Then I realized it was not De Broglie, it was uh, Bohr's son. Anyway, the point here is De Broglie made a very revolutionary expression saying that matter can exist as waves, which is very unique and uh, light can also exist as particle and wave. This was one of the very bold ideas in the early part of this uh, last century. And uh, so, as young minds, you must be prepared to make some bold uh, statements. People may criticize, may comment, but don't worry about it. As long as your conceptual idea is clear and you believe that it is a very fantastic uh, thinking, you can document it. Please try to document it. Please try to secure the document either as a patent or as an information so that one of your professors can guide you to take it further. Okay. Please believe in handshaking with the friends. Don't try to tell everything to everybody, but certainly you must have some good friends and then try to handshake with them in the sense, try to see if your idea is very genuine 
and if it has not been reported already or if it has uh, some relevance to the society etc okay so this is one uh, slide which impressed me when i gave uh, i've been giving in recent times about human intelligence or artificial intelligence and in that case you can see here the human intelligence is somewhere uh, in making calculations per second well let's say about the barrier of 10 power 14 or so this is where we are okay so the integrated circuits are all here as you see uh, eliminate this okay so the mouse brain here for example is at about 10 power 11 operations per second forget about the cost factor so the mouse is operating 10 to 11 operations per second and if you want to make a quantum computation which is optical then they touch the human brain which is about 10 for 14 or above so this is the most important thing and we have already the uh, all the type of uh, structures which are structured close to the uh, so called mouse brain so now this is about the famous moore's law so uh, the number of transistors on an integrated circuit has been doubling as you said in every period uh, so you can see we are making something like 20 million operations in a transistor. So this is how the current scenario lies. So this is all to tell you that uh, semiconductors are the backbone, not only for the existing devices which operate in your laptop or for the existing devices which does what is known as supercomputing or for those futuristic devices we want to do in uh, human uh, or artificial intelligence. So there are three forms of matter as students here knows we only talk about solid liquid and uh, gaseous there is a fourth state of matter which we are not discussing which is very uh, famously known as a plasma state so in the solid state we are more concerned about ordered materials which is crystalline and we are also having a lot of materials in our day-to-day -day life as and other materials which are having what is known as a short range ordering Whereas in a crystalline material, we have long range ordering, which makes it more dependable. And a crystalline material means it is more reliable in the performance and it is the, in the most highest purified form compared to any other chemical purification. So these are the two basic reasons why we try to target a crystal. The crystal means it is in the highest purified form of its chemical state. And the second most important thing is a crystalline material will perform very highly in a reliable manner. These are the two things. So we have the matrix of the periodic table of elements. We can take various metals. We can take a non-metal. We can take an alkaline metal. We can take a transition metal. We can take a rare earth metal and then try to mix them and try to find out what will be the property in terms of electrical property. We are more going to discuss about semiconductors. So I'm trying to talk to you more about electrical type. So these are the ways one can mix uh, common semiconductor which is very popular as of today for example silicon is one of the materials which we use in a day-to-day -day way in terms of the integrated circuit in the laptop or in any uh, desktop computer it is used as a, even as a high energy radiation detector if you dope it with the lithium which is known as silly detector and similarly if you use germanium it can be called as a silly detector in fact as many of you might be informed it was not silicon which was very prominent it was initially germanium but because silicon is abundantly available in nature as silicon dioxide next to water on earth's crust people started to work on silicon initially they tried to make a transistor action and then subsequently they realized it was not functionally very effective in germanium because it could not make an oxide layer which is controllable so people moved to silicon and subsequently also silicon was abundantly available so people moved into silicon silicon as it is or germanium as it is as an inherent limitation in spite of the fact it is being used in today's integrated circuit everywhere and similarly in all the solar cells most of the solar cells for commercial applications we use silicon but there are always a niche platform or a specialized platform so for example the mobile phone you use or the connectivity with the landline line to another landline with the fiber uh, optics is done using these three phase semiconductors, which are very prominently known as gallimard and DNA phosphate. Gallimard in particular has been more popular or is popular with respect to the mobile phones you use. The mobile phones as not silicon, it has a transceiver which is made out of gallimard 
a transceiver is nothing but a transmitter and a receiver. So you have gallium arsenide in, in that. And uh, similarly, this has also been attempted to be a solar cell material, but subsequently indium phosphate was proved to be more radiation uh, tolerant. And so for space applications, people attempted to use indium phosphate based solar cells. But even in the last rovers mission of Mars, gallium arsenide or germanium substrate was used to achieve relatively very high efficiency of the order of 36%. And so it is always a competing platform. And so there are several materials which are being used. Currently, we are in the sense in Nana University, we have been working in the last 10 years on material which is known as gallium nitrate, indium nitrate, and the alloy aluminum nitrate. These are very interesting because you can tune the band gap from something like 6 EV to or close to 1 or 1.1 EV. This is the most interesting aspect of it. This is called as band gap engineering. For example, if you mix gallium arsenide and indium phosphate, you can call it as indium gallium arsenide phosphate. And this is the material which we use for fiber optic communication. Even if any of you are using a landline and or rather an internet, you must remember there is always an indium gallium arsenide phosphate laser and a detector which is being used as of today's technology. Whereas if you go to the streets and see uh, the LED lit, uh, let us say a street light um, or, a, uh, a, or a, a traffic signal or the white LED TVs which you may have in your homes or the white LED bulbs which are being used in your offices, you must remember they are made out of this gallium nitride alloyed with indium nitride or alloyed with aluminum nitride. It is basically the colors that we are interested. So this is a very simple fundamental physics equation which says E equal to H nu and if you do the uh, transformation, the lambda which is coming out of this, the E is the energy gap like 1.1 or 3 EV or 4 EV or 6 EV. So if you do this mathematical simple calculation, lambda will be equal to 1.24 divided by the EG which will be the band gap. So you can put a definite number of this band gap value from something like 3.2 or 1.1, you can mix it as you like, make an alloy, and then subsequently you will get the band gap. And from the band gap, you will calculate lambda equal to 1.24 divided by here is EG, and therefore you will get the corresponding light emission. So the light emission can be in the visible region, as you can see from something like red to blue, or it can also be in the ultraviolet. What is the purpose of this? As you know, the white LED is nothing but a mixture of RBG, that is red, blue and green. If you mix appropriately the red, blue and green, put a frontal lens or you just have a password and then make it shine on this, you will get the corresponding white light. Or you can also take this so-called ultraviolet LED and then you can subsequently make it fall on a password, yellow password and that yellow password will release a white light. So this is how you try to use. Whereas people like uh, the SSPL who have been more specialized in defense related activities, they have been producing mercury cadmium telluride. I'm not going into the details. Maybe Dr. Sharma will give you highlights of it. So you have other materials which are known as 2,6 semiconductors. This gallium arsenide and indium phosphate falls in the category of 3,5 because gallium is in the third group of the periodic table and arsenic is in the fifth group. So they're prominently known as gallium arsenide and indium phosphate as 3,5 compound semiconductors. Similarly, indium arsenide and indium antimony. Whereas this cadmium telluride, cadmium selenide, etc. called as two six semiconductors because cadmium is in the second group, selenium, tellurium, etc. are in the sixth group and they have their own specific applications in the red or the infrared area. Whereas this material area is now being properly used for various applications in light emission. Not only in light emission, it is also used as high electron mobility transistors, etc. People are also trying to use silicon carbide, which has a, uh, one of the very big history of uh, silicon carbide in this country, uh, Dr. A.K. Verma, who was the first CSIR Director General and the NPL Director, he was working in Blackmore's laboratory in the UK, and then he was the first to see a spiral in the silicon carbide crystals. He was trying to observe the surface of the silicon carbide, and then he observed spirals, and this spiral was considered to be the very fundamental thing for crystal growth process as like other uh, crystal growth theories, but this is also considered to be one of the very fundamental area. And then we had a very strong activity in various crystallographic activities and particularly silicon carbide as what is known as a polytapism. It exists in more than 200 crystal structures 
So it is still a competing material with respect to gallium nitride in terms of lifetime limiting device, devices or also in terms of uh, what I call as high electron mobility transistors. In fact, silicon carbide can work at very high temperatures and very high frequencies compared to also gallium nitride. But still, there are certain reasons why silicon carbide is not that much popular because the growth itself is very complicated. And beyond the growth complications, the cost effectiveness has been brought down drastically, as uh, Dr. Segal said, the director of uh, NIT Srinagar said, we always try to find out a competing activity with respect to the commercial device in terms of its cost and niche devices there we don't worry about the cost. What we mean as niche device, for example, we use gallium arsenide solar cells in space applications like the Mars mission or any other mission because in space we don't have any other source of uh, producing energy except to use a semiconductor and make the semiconductor function as a solar cell and from the solar cell you get the corresponding uh, electrical energy. So here the cost is not very important. It is the functionality, it is the prime observe, uh, importance. Whereas in silicon, we are trying to use it for tertiary applications and then we have to only consider the cost. And so the cost is very important also in one aspect. Anyway, I'm going to go into the details of some of these applications. As you know, many of these applications have been in place earlier. For example, we had a street light, not that we did not have a street light, but the street light has been made into LED based street light, which means we can have it continuously used for 24 hours or at least something like 12 hours without any problem. The fundamental reason to use LED is it consumes one third of the energy requirement as compared to the same lighting, which is for a given intensity. Okay, if you take or if you need 1000 watts related intensity for a square area of one meter by one meter, the same intensity can be provided by a LED lamp at one third the energy consumption. That is one of the biggest advantage. And so you can even put it on any place where you need to continuously have this lighting made available. For example, you can grow even plants because plants need photosynthesis and you can use instead of a place like Srinagar where you may have some difficulty in the winter, you can use these LED based lights because LED lights doesn't consume energy. It is not toxic like the, the mercury lamps and therefore it has the biggest advantage of using it for different applications. The, as I said, one of the fundamental thing to this is, this is a semiconductor device. So it is known as a solid state lighting, which means you can control the intensity for a given lighting at a given point. And similarly, you can make it as a standalone system. Even you can use it in automobile and use it in water bodies. You can use it in thermal surfaces, anywhere you can use because this can be made as a standalone uh, lighting device, unlike using a wired uh, light, which you be used as of today, because the wired need was due to the AC or the alternating current we have been using, whereas for an LED, it is a direct current, and so therefore you can use a battery, you can use a solar panel output as a DC, you can use various forms of energy, and then you can accordingly make the light made available. So this is a simple structure of an LED. So it has a pro, uh, pole and an electron, as you see here, this is nothing but an N-type device or an N-type semiconductor. This is a P-type. And when they try to recombine, we call it as a recombination. And this recombination releases a photon because a hole interacts with the uh, electron. And then there is in some form of energy which is to be released. And that energy is released as a photon, which you know is a massless uh, uh, emission or a particle. So you can have a, this is how I have blown up this point, which is known as a negative terminal. And this is known as a positive terminal. So you see here, there is an active region, but at the base we have an N-type gallium nitride top, we have a type So it is in for a, a kind of demonstration I'm showing, but in reality, there are n number of multiple layers not just only gallium nitride or a, a, a given semiconductor. There will be more number of layers, which will be semiconductor, but it will have to confine the carriers and it will have to produce more intense output. So we call it as a multi-quantum well, which is basically the physics which you people study. So, so if somebody says quantum physics is very dry or somebody doesn't understand quantum physics, please see here, without quantum physics, you cannot have a multi-quantum well. 
and without a multi quantum bell your led lights will not be illuminative or bright okay so it is used as backlighting in mobile phones it can be used as a tv screen it can be used as a portable uh, screen etc and this is a typical semiconductor i don't want to go into the detail so here you see if i pump some energy then this can the carriers from the valence band can be moved to the conduction band whereas in the metal there is a very small or literally no gap and the thermal level is overlapping and therefore if you have any thermal energy the carriers may still move this is a simple form of a matter or a metal so this is a these are some of the prominent materials being used for h is the form of uh, hexagon in silicon carbide a 6H is the same silicon carbide. You can see here in the hexagonal form, the band gap is 3 EV, whereas in the four uh, layer or the four atoms system, it is 3.2 EV. So the binding energies with respect to one atom of silicon and carbon, if they vary, accordingly the band gap can vary. Whereas for gallium nitride, you see 3.4, aluminum nitride, you see 6.1. And if you mix this aluminum nitride and gallium nitride, you can have band gap from 6.3.4 to 6.18. So this is the 2D confinement. What we mean by if you have a bulk semiconductor, we call it as the conduction band and it has a valence band. Whereas if you take a potential layers, which I will show you much more in detail in the next few uh, few graphs. As I said, if you have several layers of they will produce discrete energy levels and they will be termed as a quantum bell. So you can have multiple quantum bells and this can be produced by various epitaxial techniques. These are not only used for conventional visible region, they are also used in infrared detectors as uh, Dr. Sharma may elaborate on this. They have been working on a very long time on this kind of uh, infrared uh, detections. So solar cells, as I said, every small uh, segment of this, this small area is what I have blown up here. And now you can call this as a panel, okay? And if you connect, more than one panel or n number of panels then that is called as a system as of today we can get something like 360 watts here i have said 60 hybrid silicon cells of some uh, dimensions or a given dimension i only showed 235 watts peak per hour but currently we can get something like 360 watts they are called as uh, bifocal and therefore you can get more energy out of the same area this is what is known as a concentrated solar cells. Here, once again, you see the efficiencies are very high in this case. You can get very high efficiencies of the order of 40% or even 50%. But you can see here, they are not just one or two materials or even one layer of silicon N-type and P-type. You can see here, we have indium gallium phosphide and then we have indium gallium oxide on top of germanium. All of them is, with, these are known as frontal lens. And these frontal lenses focus onto these layers, and therefore you get very high efficiency. Theoretically, one can get as high as 60% efficiencies. These are areas which are not still opened up, or people have not gained very good results. So, young minds can think about it. These are known as intermediate band cell solar cells. So, if you are able to structure and then match the current with the, the different layers or multiple junction solar cells you will be able to get very high efficiencies of the order of 60%. So, I just want to tell you, it is not always about uh, a large, complicated, uh, let's say, or rather a binary material which produces a semiconductor. A simple element like silicon and germanium, I told you, can be a very good uh, semiconductor, and it serves several purposes. As you see here, silicon has a band gap of 1.1 EV, and uh, germanium has a band gap of 0.3 EV. The only fundamental limitation here is they are indirect band gap materials, and so it cannot be made so simply. There are ways to make some light emission, which are known as porous silicon, but in general, you cannot get light as like in gallium nitride or in gallium oxide, which are direct band gap semiconductors, and therefore you can get light emission. Look at this another special problem here with respect to this. If you are able to see it, I'll be very happy. There is a carbon carbon bonding, okay. This is what is known as a diamond, and it is called as an insulator with a band gap which is close to 60 will be said. So the distance of carbon to carbon bonding in a diamond material, which is known as a diamond structure, is 0.17. But if you increase this diamond bond or the carbon carbon distances, if you slightly keep increasing it, you can get a band gap even close to something like 1 EV 
or whatever band uh, energies you want. It, it is not so simple, but you can make it. Okay, this is one of the ways to attain this. For example, if you take a, a layer of graphene, which is nothing but a sheet of graphite, and if you try to cut a sheet of graphite as thin as a mono layer, which means the distance between two ca carbon atoms, one upon another, or one with respect to the other on the other side. So if you take a sheet of carbon atoms from a graphite, then it is called as a graphene. Then if you put hydrogen atoms on top of it, here you see these are hydrogen atoms. This hydrogen will form a bonding and this will be called as a graphene structure. What do we mean by this? It's an exchange structure and so therefore it is called as graphene. There is also one more which is known as graphone. But let me tell you, why is it very important? Adding hydrogen is very important because we want to find out alternate sources of energy. One of the alternate sources of energy is hydrogen. But there are some limitations with respect to the saving of hydrogen energy. And so therefore it has to be produced at the point of use. And then in one way you can uh, uh, extract hydrogen from natural environment is by making it react with graphene and then making it graphene. And once that graphene is achieved, you can still release that uh, hydrogen by slightly heating this graphene. So there are similar structures which are being attempted. I want to enthuse the young minds here. I'm not going to reveal everything, but I will give you a flavor of it. So say, for example, this is a structure which is a two-dimensional structure like graphene, which is known as molybdenum sulfide. And if you see here, the distances vary along this axis as 3.16. And this is a structure which is a 2H, which means an hexagonal structure. And if you look at it in another direction, then it is a tetragonal structure. So what is it important? How is it so uh, influential? See, for example, a group has just taken a 2H uh, structure of this molybdenum sulfide, and then they have added one single atom of ruthenium. And then you see here, they have taken a, a transmission electron microscope. And with the transmission electron microscope, they show that it forms 1T, which means a tetragonal structure. And then when they allow more time, you see they are able to make a tetragonal structure of larger dimension, which means the atoms are getting disturbed and therefore the tetragonal uh, phase formation occurs. So this is a very interesting thing in the sense you have a molybdenum sulfide and you put one atom of ruthenium and then you have transformed that given area into a different crystal structure for reasons of crystallography. And now what is this? Interest. So here the interest is H, hexagonal structure of molybdenum sulfide is semiconductor, whereas if you make a tetragonal structure, it can be metallic in nature. So you can produce a metal semiconductor metal device. This is the most important part of such fundamental investigation. And this you can try to take it as a problem and then find more solutions. There is another area which has been uh, prominent in the recent times with respect to semiconductors. We have been always thinking about an electron or a hole. But beyond that, people thought about the spin state of an electron, and they said, if I can control the spin state either as plus off or a minus off or up state or the down state, I'll be able to polarize the spins. And once I am able to polarize the spins, I'll be able to make devices which are storage devices, which can be other kind of devices. So one of the thing is you can take a semiconductor. You can add a dilute uh, magnetic semiconductor in the sense you can add a transition metal element and then make it a dilute magnetic semiconductor. If you have more transition metal elements, it will become a ferromagnet. So you can have a non volatile cemetery, you can have a spin based logic computation, you can have a spin emitter. So these are some of the devices. I don't want, you can have multifunctional devices. These are the future directions for want of time and for various reasons. I'm just quickly trying to. Uh, uh, jump into another important area which I thought I should expose to the students. So the search for new elements led to the golden age of chemistry. It led to the golden age of particle physics. It uh, made people ask fundamental questions in fundamental states of matter. And then we had also the quantum world where we understood metal insulators, superconductors, magnets, etc. Many of these states are differentiated by what is known as a broken symmetry. So a magnet is a broken rotational symmetry. A crystal is a broken translational symmetry. A superconductor is a broken what is known as a symmetry. So if I have a material, and then if I can make a 
topology of curve fit in the sense if i take a wire and then if you make these two ends of the wire joined then i can make a so called circle or if i elongate these ends then i can make an ellipse or i can twist and as you see here i can make a particular uh, state which is called as the topological study of continuity and connectivity so the topological distinction between a conventional insulator and a quantum spin hall insulator so now we are trying to move into a new domain which is known as topological materials which means you have certain um, kinds of surface states which allow the conduction property to happen instead of an insulator property can you just hold for a second i have a small large and call so i'll uh, finish this call and then continue my work okay just one second Okay, thank you for your patience. I'm sorry I had to go for this uh, call. This is something due to some personal issues. Anyway, the issue is I'm trying to bring in a new concept of a material. If you you all know as physics students or students at NIT, there are three simple electrical conduction. One is metallic, another is insulated. Another third one we described as a semiconductor. So the in between now we are uh, so in between we are now introducing a topological material which is in the topological insulator state, which means a bulk form of a material will be uh, totally insulating. But if you measure the surface states through what is known as a quantum Hall effect, then you will realize there are conducting states. I'm repeating a quantum uh, spin hall insulator or in general uh, topological insulator is different from a conventional insulator. Conventional insulators are totally insulating with their very high coefficient of resistance, whereas a topological insulator has certain bound confined states or surface states which are known as time invariant and in these states you try to identify and then you try to play with these states. This is what people are now working and if you are interested, you can interact or you can work more on this topic. Very quickly, I will show you, this uh, is a very simple uh, form of a wave where we call it as a balance band. And this is another which we call as a conduction band. This is an imaginary uh, time you can even put it on top of this, but for the sake of understanding, we try to put it like this in an inverted way. And also you try to mark this as a gap because there is an energy required to move from this wave to the top wave, which is the conduction band. Now, if you see here, I have this uh, red color code for up and down spins, or rather blue is for up spin. So this blue is for an up spin state. As I told you, the spin of an electron can be termed as up spin or plus off or minus off, which can be down spin. Okay. So now, if I take a blue, this line, which is the traveling of my electron with an uh, up state, I am trying to depict it like this. So when it goes to the conduction band, it falls in this manner here. Okay. So similarly, the down spin is falling, uh, is moving up, and then it is falling down like this. So if there is a wave pattern of k equal to 0 or 5, then you say it is merging like this. And here, this is known as a direct point. I'll show you a little bit more in the next views. So you see here, this is the up, uh, I'm sorry, the downswing, which when it falls, turns out to be the upswing. And similarly, the upswing here, when it is in the connection band, which can be represented in this manner here. Okay. So. Once again, this gap can be enlarging because of the topological state. And why is it happening? You can see here, these are these reasons. So you have a topological state, which is known as a trivial state. 
the same topological state in a different form can be also the trivial state and if this is in a perfect way the atoms are arranged then this trivial state only will produce a perfect insulator whereas if it is arranged in a different form in confined geometries or in specific geometries then you have a state which is still a trivial but you can see here in this form in a non trivial case as i said you see here i showed you this so you try to have a non trivial state by having a connectivity which is different and a continuity which is existing but the connectivities are different so this is where you get this topological state and this is where we are now trying to work and we are trying to make certain types of materials which can be deeply understood in following these ideas i am not going into the details of these slides because i have only few i hope i can take another 5 minutes so the electronics was with the control and maneuverability or the uh, if we can functionalize an electron and control and manipulate the electron that is known as an electronics with the electronics you can make diodes transistors solar cells lasers and detectors you can manipulate the charge of the electron whereas in spintronics you can manipulate the spin state of the electron when i manipulate the spin state of the electron i must realize i must more more, more so called i must have a polarized state whether it is up state or the down state it cannot have both of them that is what we call as a polarized state so if i have a polarized state of the up state or the down state i can also have an intermediate point it can be in an inclined angle which can also be polarized and that polarized state is very useful for my spintronic device so i can take even a ferromagnetic material and then make this spintronic device but it is more appropriate because if you couple the electronics with the spintronics you have much more maneuverability or what is known as a manipulation ability and therefore it is more efficiently used to have a p type semiconductor where the electrons are minority carriers and you try to manipulate the minority carriers and then polarize them or make it available for given use two dimensional materials are more used in this kind of activities a single layer material is more attractive for several reasons and therefore we are trying to make dimensional materials or two dimensional materials or what we call even as a one dimensional material so these are uh, uh, so called uh, the nanotechnology wherein many of you would have you know, been taught about bottom up approach which means you put brick by brick and then build a building or you take a monoblock or like a huge mountain and then you chisel out the parts which are not interesting to you and then this is called as a top down approach in any way you try to have simple layered materials or you can have a nano sheet you can have couple of sheets one on top of this and then you can have multiple layers of different quality or different uh, um, material properties so this can give rise to new physics and applications and these are known as nano sheets this is a typical way of polarizing the spin state as i said the spin state need not be in the up state or the down state it can also be in an intermediate state and this is how the topological materials are being taught uh, or people are discussing this method of it as a band gap of 0.21 eb and people are trying to try okay so should i stop yeah yeah i can stop yeah thank you i will conclude I have found many internet problems. I don't know how many of you have to solve them. What they solve them? You may have to know what they do. After that, you have to make the initial batch. Correct. Is okay. That is all. Now, in this case, in this case, which one? Or which one? Or which one? Sir, which one? Or 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 which one? இன்டர்நெட் ப்ராப்ளம் ஃபோன் பண்ணி சொன்னாங்க ஹலோ எஸ் எஸ் சார் யா ஷல் ஐ கண்டினியூ அண்ட் க்ளோஸ் ஆர் எனஃப் இஸ் எனஃப் 
no sir sir you uh, please continue we can uh, have the session till uh, uh, like for three more minutes we can have okay. uh, question answer session okay. after uh, that my slides are viewable now yes sir yes okay i will close so we have tried to grow this uh, materials which are of interest for topological applications we have grown bismuth telluride then we have grown chromium tin telluride iron tan tantalum sulfide i am currently trying to grow zirconium telluride so i just uh, this is grown by what is known as a chemical vapor transport in which case bismuth and tellurium are mixed and there is also a transporting agent which is uh, excess of tellurium so this grows and then we try to grow them as uh, bulk crystals which can be cut as flakes and then used for specific device applications or for uh, fundamental investigations so i'm just trying to skip all this there is a very powerful technique which is known as a photomission spectroscopy which is uh, also known as angle resolved photoelectron spectroscopy with which only people try to understand this kind of photometric materials and this is a one another material system which is of recent interest titanium sulfide and people have used raman spectroscopy to understand this uh, titanium sulfide in terms of its uh, bond distances and its influence on the optical and electrical properties so this titanium sulfide have anisotropic properties and this has been confirmed using raman spectroscopy this is what is known as uh, sfrs so i don't want to go into the details but i just want to enthuse the young minds that our own technologies our own fundamental investigations are now playing very important role in progress of latest materials and the related technology so just don't believe that raman spectroscopy has done in molecular systems and then they used to have some stokes line anti stokes line etc that is not the only thing we are now still making a lot of progress and the world is making process, progress on a new material which was topological insulator which was given a nobel prize in 2015 this was all a conceptual fundamental mathematical idea but then people are trying to make use of it by trying to have an efficient understanding or better understanding by using raman spectroscopy which is known as sfrs so these are very important to all of you and i hope uh, i made some impact on you to understand the various aspects of semiconductors starting from fundamentals in terms of elementary semiconductors compound semiconductors and multiple layered compound semiconductors and etc just quickly to tell you how these processes happen you take a material you try to melt it you make it as a bulk crystal then you try to have uh, cut it as a wafer we call it and then polish it and then the crystal can also be grown for example in floating zone where there will be removal of oxygen impurity is much better and therefore you have what is known as an electronic grade silicon and then this electronic grade silicon as you see here these are in large sizes so more than 600 kg can be grown and something like 12 inches diameter can be grown initially they grew only millimeter diameter or 1 cm diameter now they are growing it is in 12 inches in diameter and these 12 inches are being used for subsequent polishing and then fabrication these are some of the gallium carbonate crystals which i grew in 1990s and then i made use of it to make this is the solar cell for space applications which i tested in italy and then these are some of the germanium crystals which has been grown once again for our isro on top of it we can grow gallium arsenide and use it for device application so a typical crystal is made as a substrate as i said you cut as a wafer which is typically from 2 inches to 12 inches and then you grow layers of different materials and once you make these layers of different materials you can Uh, make a device and then pack it this is how an led is available for your use in uh, in switching on your computer you see a small light in different colors that is nothing but a light emitting diode which is a focused uh, emission of light and the dimensions are only three times the thickness of your hair 300 microns so if you take a typical led its height length and the breadth are only roughly of the order of 300 to 350 microns so that is more than sufficient to have a device this is the biggest advantage of semiconductor devices so epitaxial growth is what is about a thin layer but you try to make a deposition in a very very controlled way and therefore you can have this is the fundamental of physics if you have a three dimensional semiconductor you have a continuum states whereas here you have a discrete states in a quantum similarly in 
quantum air and a quantum dot who have discrete states and these quantum dot based devices have no influence or they cannot be influenced by temperature so a semiconductor drive many of you might be knowing the band gap can slightly vary with respect to temperature but here <coughs> this is the <coughs> epitaxial system which we established in uh, 99 and this is what is known as a metal organic chemical of a portion system and we grow some of the very good quality material layers and we interact continuously with various national laboratories and this is what is known as a multi quantum well and this is the uh, kind of uh, uh, equipment we use which was uh, made available to us by DST at a cost of about six crores and then we had a lot of peripheral facilities like chiller UPS etc which all ran to about 10 crores. So these are what is known as the uh, source materials are kept here at cryogenic temperatures and these uh, sources are pumped into this and then they reach this is the reactor so the source materials reach the reactor and this is a substrate and these layers are grown on top of this and this is some monetary mechanism which is known as an in-situ measurement tool and we try to grow this. So I just stop and I thank Professor Shah, his team and everybody involved in this kind of uh, efforts to uh, give the best of the best to the student community. Thank you all. Thank you very much, sir. That was indeed an informative session. So, uh, uh, we have a few questions from the audience. Yes, please. Hello, sir. Just a second. So, uh, Dr. Ashwajit is asking manipulation means can we make either clockwise or anti clockwise using spintronics? See, basically, this clockwise or anti clockwise is all about a conceptual idea. Okay, so this the, the spin state of the electron has already been proved, and so therefore, either it is clockwise or anti clockwise is a term of reference. And similarly, the term of reference has been earlier as plus off or minus off. And the elementary school level, we try to tell the children that it is up state or down state. So the manipulation is now in terms of positioning it in between also. So you can position the electron not in the, let us say you are interested in clockwise. So it moves like this to come back to the same position. Okay. So when it moves in the clockwise, it can be positioned in an intermediary point at like, let us say from a origin, it can be at 20 degree, 30 degree or 40 degree or 50 degree or 90 degree. What is the use of it? The use is I can pass on an information without a physical connectivity. Okay, so you can communicate from one spin state of an electron to another spin state of an electron. If both of them are positioned in the same angle or in the same up state or in the same down state. This is the most important thing. This is where we are now trying to focus. And so obviously, as you ask a right question, whether it is a clockwise or anti-clockwise, the manipulation can be done by what you do in polarization. If you try to make the electron move across in a material system, and if it is moving in this spin state, it can be polarized. Or it can be positioned in this state and it can be moved. That is also the spin state. In fact, the spin polarization concept was evolved by Indians by name Das and Das in the US, but still the recognition is to us. Okay. So you can manipulate by, in principle, calling it as clockwise manipulation or anti clockwise manipulation. Thank you, sir. Sir, next question is how to make transparent solar panels? See, the, uh, the fundamental idea is in. A solar panel there is a material okay so for example you have your hand if light falls on your hand you know you can see your hand this is reflection if yes, the sir. same light is falling through a glass window you see it is not completely uh, getting reflected but it is getting transmitted and whereas if you take another material or, or a wood material you don't see any light inside your home because the wood is totally uh, blocking or absorbing the light which is coming from outside or going from inside. So, 
these are the three fundamentals of what is known as an optical activity which means you have reflection absorption and transmission so in a solar cell you have a material which has to absorb the light which is coming from the sun and sun has a spectrum which is from the uv to ir or it is also beyond but we are trying to talk only in this region so if you have a visible spectrum for example if you want to have silicon as a solar cell in the visible spectrum silicon will absorb that 1.1 ev related energy which means it is close to red right but if you use mercury uh, cadmium telluride it will absorb still further into the infrared region which is a big advantage because in india we have a lot of this infrared also which is also about making the solar panel operate even beyond or rather with even less sunlight so using a solar panel as transparent is i do not uh, view it as very uh, purposeful because if you want to have a solar panel the light which is coming from the sun has to be absorbed and the light has to interact with your uh, material and after interaction it has to convert it into uh, like so called electrical output okay so it is more about uh, importance is about absorbing as much of energy or light which is coming from the sun and then converting it into an electrical energy so here if it is transparent the purpose will be very uh, much different of course we use what is known as an anti reflection coating in which case the anti reflection coating will enable the solar cell to increase the efficiency if you are take the silicon solar cells the silicon solar cells are having only efficiency of the order of 15 to 16% but if you coat uh, anti reflection coating at the appropriate for the appropriate wavelengths with the appropriate thickness then you can raise the efficiency as close to 19% or 20% efficiency so if you are thinking about uh, transparency the transparency has to do with the reflective property okay or if you are talking about the light getting uh, transparent that is to do with the increasing the efficiency but if you talk about the real active solar cell the active solar cell is all about absorbing the light which is coming from the sun and converting into an electrical energy i hope i clarify hello hello thank you sir thank you sir yes so uh, next question goes as how can we manipulate spins of electron manipulate spin of electron electron spin sir yeah that is what i said see if you have, if you want a small con correlation i generally don't like correlations or comparisons with real life but it is to make you understand a little bit easier if you have a kind of a pipe then if you have a pipe which has a diameter uh, smaller than your finger okay then this finger cannot pass through in this direction the vertical direction i hope you see me see my uh, yes sir yes sir video. so if i have a finger which is like this i cannot pass this finger in this uh, hole okay but instead if my make the uh, hole bigger this finger can pass through or if i have the finger which is very small then in this hole it may pass through so this is where you try to understand how to polarize the spin and then try to manipulate it it is not exactly about the physical dimension it is about putting the spin in a particular angle or freezing it at a particular position you have to freeze this spin and then you can make it polarize and then you can make it move so for example if you have a transition metal which is uh, dispersed in a semiconductor which is known as a dilute magnetic semiconductor in that case obviously if you have an electron in a p type material which is a minority carrier that electron which can be manipulated in the field of the so called ferromagnet or the transition metal so that magnetic material state will enable this polarization and then you can gain correspondingly a particular spin state you can Thank manipulate you, you can manipulate the spin state okay sir okay sir sir next question is from vikas dahiya he is asking uh, could we replace silicon by graphene in this as a semiconductor see absolutely everybody can be replaced by another person no individual or no matter is replaced 
okay but we have to remember the abundance of a given material silicon and carbon are available in nature uh, as the biggest uh, availability but silicon has several uh, edges over at the moment with respect to graphene or carbon because carbon can be always uh, made available from graphite and graphite or carbon resources are plenty in earth surface as a uh, gold water is the best available resource on earth surface next is uh, the sand which is known as silicon dioxide and if you go deeper into the earth surface you get more of carbon so graphene can always replace various forms of devices but silicon has its own niche and the silicon has its own role to play for example silicon can be easily converted to silicon dioxide so you can have a mass device which is known as metal oxide semiconductor device whereas in graphene if you have to have an oxide layer it may have to be in a different form and the coating or the deposition has to be very different so you can always try uh, there is not nothing to be uh, in fact graphene or is being used as interconnectors replacing copper this is one of the biggest works which was done by the present at delhi iit director also professor rao so there are various ways to think and various ways of solving lot of problems but you cannot per se remove one material in semiconductor domain and then replace it with another semiconductor material because its availability its handling procedures there are a lot of demands on that for example cadmium telluride has a very high efficiency you can call it as a copper indium sulfate copper indium telluride etc they have a relatively very high efficiency but the availability of these resources of uh, so called indium tellurium etc are very limited and so we still use silicon oil. there are what is known as the thin film solar cells wherein they use uh, gas which means copper indium sulfide or copper indium selenide etc but their availability and the production abilities are very limited so people still use silicon for terrestrial cells but as i told you if you want to use it for space solar cells nobody worries about the cost nobody worries about anything except for the efficiency because in the space uh, when you go the payload has to be ca calculated based on the uh, kind of uh, expenditures involved so it is not very simple so you can think about it you can make some devices which you may replace silicon also i'm not sure i cannot give you a straight answer okay yes sir thank you sir sir there are a few more questions but uh, due to the insufficient time uh, uh, i would uh, request uh, sir to conclude this session if I'll, anybody has any questions they can send an email to me so that i yes, can sir. try to reply in email i have collected all the uh, questions okay thanks sir i will send a reply to Professor Kumar, thank you. I do not have words to thank you. I am short no, no, of no. words. I am no, short I, of I, words. No, no, no. I have to thank you. I am really. It's a very great mm -hmm. honor. And at the same time, I thank you because you are doing a wonderful service to the student community. There's no way I can tell my thanks to you because it's <laughs> not so really easy to. We have been organizing such programs, and we hardly get a good number of students. in fact i want to tell the student community if somebody is interested to take up a phd program in uk i have a great friend of me offering me offering a good fellowship but he wants some brilliant students so if one of you is interested to work on semiconductor based devices and also characterize it using raman spectroscopy in fact he is using most of the time only raman spectroscopy but he is going to give you a good fellowship and then support you for the phd program and if some of you are interested you can communicate to me i call you by phone i will discuss with you then i will make the decision i don't want to tell that i will just forward your resume so that you will get the fellowship i don't want to make false promise but if there is a brilliant student or a student who is motivated dedicated i can certainly recommend him thank you professor shah thank you sir thank you sir we are blessed thank you sir